All right, so now about the um, topic cloud native Java EE. Of course, I like to talk about uh, Java Enterprise, and this is going to be a buzzword uh, driven session, so cloud native. Um, who of you knows what cloud native is about? Okay, this is good because um, this is a very buzz, uh, buzzword and uh, over overused uh, buzzword, the cloud native um, applications. And cloud native is about writing applications that are built and meant f well to run in the cloud that follow modern principles, principles of how to write and how to develop applications. And how I would describe it in my words is it's the reasonable way to write modern applications that are not necessarily meant only for the cloud, but in general. How to write systems consisting of one or several applications that are built in a modern way. Maybe you've heard of uh, the term the 12-factor app, and this goes into a similar direction. It's shows a couple of concerns that an application should have to be built in a modern and reasonable way. For example, in code base that all code is tracked in version control and so on and so forth. So f uh, some of these concerns are quite, I would say, n logical and y you definitely should follow them, but some can be quite, quite challenging. So a couple of interesting and important approaches are, for example, that the configuration is stored in the environment and how you should keep your environments as similar as possible. And these things are very important. For example, if you write an enterprise application and you have a deployment pipeline, a continuous delivery pipeline, you want to test your application in an automated way and you do so best if you minimize the differences. So if you test the application in the same way how it will run in production later on, then you can be very sure that everything works. If you have a lot of differences from test to production or from test to staging to production, in terms of databases, in terms of different um, um, loggings and so on and so forth, then these are always the points that could go wrong when you go to production later on. And it also um, increases the effort. So I will show you a couple of ways how to make this simpler, that you write applications that minimize these um, differences, for example. So I want to um, build Java EE applications, two actually, that will collaborate with each other, that run in modern Java EE application servers and that run on container technology. Yeah, here's the space, go ahead. And who of you uh, uses Docker? Docker, the, the container, you know? Okay, very good, then I will show you um, what that is. And the, uh, this is the approach we will do. And I will live code everything from scratch so that you can see what we are doing. So what I will do, I will create a Maven project um, that is called, of course, Hello Cloud. So a Hello World pro a project that will serve Hello World over HTTP, over REST. And what I just created was... Sorry. Yes. Font size, of course. Like this. So what I just created was a Maven archetype. Uh, this is just a script. It's like a Maven archetype. So this is the most basic and most simple Java EE project. I will open this with IntelliJ and show you what it is um, about. Temp hello cloud. And 
open this. And the pom file is almost empty. It only contains the Java E7 API, which is, uh, which is provided. So this means it won't end up in our WAR file. And this will be important later on. And also, it just includes the JAXRS configuration class to bootstrap the JAXRS application. This is needed uh, when we want to include JAXRS. And that's it. That's all we need for now. And I will write my own JAXRS resource called Hello Resource. And of course, this will be a JAXRS resource annotated by at path hello that means under slash hello it will serve some content and it's a very simple example it will return hello world or hello Hiroshima that's better right and of course we are in a Java enterprise scenario so we want to have a managed CDI bean for example a greeter that means that this is actually served from this class it will output a string and that's it this is of course a very simple example it will just output hello world but now the interesting thing is how do we execute it? How do we run it in a cloud-native way, right? This we b will be built in a WAR file. Let me show you. I will use Maven, so Maven clean package to build it, and then we have a nice WAR file which is not too big. This is only 4K, 4 kilobyte. Why is it that small? Because we use Java EE in a modern way with a provided API. That means that all the implementation is part of your application server and not part of the deployment artifact. This only contains the class files that are written by you, that are part of the application. And we could run, we could, uh, run this in a modern application server, for example, Whitefly. And then we could run this application server. But what we want to do instead, we want to run the application server in a Docker container. A Docker container is a way how to run Unix processes basically in the kernel but separated from all the other processes. It's somewhat like a VM, like a virtual machine, but not with the overhead. So it's something like a computer in a computer, but it doesn't come with all the overhead of a normal virtual machine because it's actually run as part of your local host kernel. And the nice thing about it, Docker is a more or less standardized way how to ship applications. So you can build something that is a con container, actually an image, but you can think of it really as a um, container for luggage on, on ships, on container ships. And that can be shipped to your application server or to, um, to your production server or to all the environments in a standardized way. And this simplifies the deployment. And what we have to do for this is we have to write a Docker file, right? So, no, no module, a Docker file. And we can start from a base file. And the reason for this is that you don't have to wildfly you don't have to include everything yourself, right? So what we need to run it, of course, we need Java, right? We need the application server, we need our application, and we need some operating system. But what do Docker does, it provides all these layers for you if you want. So you say, I don't want to start from scratch, I already want some um, Linux um, operating system plus Java plus my, plus my application server, and the last thing I'm adding is just my application, right? And this is very thin, and this is the nice way of using Java EE. So if I add my target Hello Cloud War to the application server deployment dir, uh, Wildfly 
standalone deployments, right? This is the drop-in directory. This is then all we need because everything else is already contained in the base image. Who of you has seen such a Docker file before? Like Docker files? Nobody? Okay, so um, this is the way how you build a Docker container. And again, the way how it is built, it executes all these command and the from command is like an import. It says start from this image. And this is a private uh, image of mine, a private repository. We need this for um, the cloud environment that I'll show you in a second. And by doing so, we can um, inherit everything from that base image and provide only the last thin layer. So Docker containers consists of layers and we are only changing the last part of it. And this makes uh, the deployment very simple. So what we do here is we that we build it using docker build into a new container that we call with the same prefix. This is basically the URL of my registry. Hello cloud. Tag name colon is tag is like a version. Tag one with the dot from the current directory. And as you see, this is very fast. Although what I just built is the operating system plus Java plus the application server plus my application. And the reason why it's so fast is it uses the base image as a cache. And the base image, as I said, contains almost everything except the, the application. And just the application there is added then. And since the application is only 4 kilobyte in size, this is very fi fast. So if you use some other fat jar or fat war approach like the Spring Framework, you will add 20 megabytes of your application, right? Because it contains the implementation. And this is not that ideal because then you always have to copy 20 megabytes back and forth, right? And the interesting thing is, and this is now the best example how to show it because we don't have Wi-Fi here and I use tethering over my phone which is very slow but still it is possible at least to push it because it's only four kilobyte even th this will take long as you uh, will see in a second but if it would be even bigger then it wouldn't be possible at all and what you will see here is layer already exists so all these things actually the image is like 800 megabit a megabyte or something but it already is there it contains uh, it consists of several layers and only the last layer is added this one pushed it will take a couple of seconds to verify it on the um, registry and then it's done pushing this to my registry over the network yeah this is very slow today let me place it here so it has better <laughs> reception um, and then it is usable in the meantime oh now it's now it's done but you see, so it only pushed four kilobyte. If I would push 800 megabyte, then we would be here till next week. Now I can run this. Docker run my image. Hello cloud one. Now what it does, it runs my container. And this is what will be done in production as well. It takes the operating system, Java, Wildfly plus my application that resides in the um, deployment dir, and it runs the whole container. So what it does, it takes the container and just say run. And I can do so. Actually, I will have to run it wi with a port because I will show you this. This is just needed for the local example so that I can say localhost port 8080 with hello cloud resources the, this was the path of the JAXRS application hello and it will then say hello Hiroshima and this is now run in a docker container any questions and now what we want to do docker containers are have been around since well at least two or three years but now what we want to do, we want to combine these containers in a cloud environment. Because if you run these things, then 
like this, like I just did, then you have to manage the networking of your containers yourself. Because a container itself is it's run um, very isolated. That means you would have to define all the networking and everything yourself manually. And this is quite cumbersome. And now what we're doing instead, we're using an orchestration framework like Kubernetes. What Kubernetes is, it's a way how to run your containers in a production grade way. This is originally developed by Google and it was used in the last 10 years or something for to run production grade environments. And what it does, it runs your Docker containers and connects them and runs them actually as services. So what you can do, you can specify failovers and load balancers and this is done automatically for you. Also blue-green deployments, which I will show in a second. So basically you can think of it as take a Docker container and run it in a more sophisticated way and also combine several of them and put them together in a needed way. So um, what this is doing, we can Kubernetes, you, it is controlled by a command called kube control and now you can ask for services and you can ask for it is called pods. So this is just the default by Kubernetes. So this means this is empty. There is nothing running here. But now we want to run our Hello Cloud environment with Kubernetes. And therefore you add something similar like a Docker file but just in a YAML format in a directory called k8s for Kubernetes, this is just a shortcut, 8 because 8 characters in between. And it is written in Hello Cloud in a YAML file. And what you do, you define a service. And now we specify two concepts, a service and a so-called deployment. A service is the logical unit you want to have. So if you want to have a web server or if you want to have a database of Hello Cloud, then you specify a service. And the actual thing that is running it, the actual instance, is specified in a deployment. So the deployment will be your actual container. We can specify names here, Hello Cloud and a port. So this Hello Cloud service will be available under port 8080 and it will automatically route to one or more instances in a deployment. So we have to define a deployment as well. We can also specify a name like Hello Cloud. And as you can see here, you specify what you will run. For example, run this with one replica, with one instance and take, you ba basically specify, please take this Docker container and run it. You take the Docker container that we just specified, Hello Cloud, in a specific version, version 1, and run it. And we have to change this image pull, uh, pull policy always. And what you also specify, you, sp you can specify liveness probes. This is very nice. This will, every once in a while, ask your running container, are you still alive? And it will do so running an HTTP GET to, for example, hello cloud resources hello under port 8080. And if you then get an HTTP response smaller than 400, so 2.0 something or 3.0 something, then this means that the container is still alive, that is still running. And if not, then Kubernetes will automatically scale new containers for you. So it will redeploy it, that your service is always available if somehow possible. And this is basically it for now. And by Kubernetes apply, you can apply the configuration of some directory. And this will now create the configuration for the deployment and the service. And if we now look at the service, this means that we now specified a Hello Cloud service. 
that is access, ac um, accessible fr from internally and externally to a port. And we also have a new pod, like a pod is a running instance, a running container. This one, hello cloud, that is now status running. And we can now access our, this is a um, Kubernetes cluster that is running locally on my laptop. We can now access the cluster with the service port, hello cloud, resources hello, and it will root route to this part and give us hello Hiroshima. And any questions? And this is now how you run these containers in a cloud native way by a orchestration framework. And if I now change something, I can show you why this is a nice way of running this. So now, that is quite simple. But now let's show the advantages why we need something like an orchestration framework by combining a second application. And now the first application will use a second application to communicate. So for example, if we want a second application. I create a new one using the same script, uh, a really second s uh, standalone enterprise application as before. Um, greeting processor, because now we want to add more sophisticated greetings. That means we now want to have a second resource with a variable like a name and now we want to output a greeting <coughs> from a path parameter so if you specify a name in a path parameter that this is now calculated with a more sophisticated greeting hello from a name and this will return hello plus the name and of course, this is a very um, complicated computation, so we need a second service for it, right? <laughs> From a greeting processor. And the greeting processor will now access our second application via HTTP. So this is also another class, and it will be used to calculate the greeting for us using the name. This will be a string, and this will then output this from the greeting processor. Now, we will use a, cli a JAXRS client, using client builder, new client of course, to access our functionality over HTTP. If the application server shuts down, then we want to close our client so we don't have resource leaks, right? You do this with at pre-destroy for a method. This will be called on application shutdown. And then we specify a target to our second service, right? HTTP. Now, what do we write here as the service name? We could write an IP, which is a bad idea because IPs change. We could write a DNS. So right, this is normally a, sp a point where you specify configuration for different environments, right? We have an external system for production, for test, for staging, right? And this is the point where you want to do similar things on all the environments. Because if you change something here, then your application changes and then you didn't test the same thing as you would run in production. So now what we can do and this is the nice way of orchestration frameworks, we can specify a logical name like greeting processor, port 8080 if you want. And this logical name will then be routed appropriately on the specific environments. That means if you later run your containers in production, in test or somewhere else, the orchestration framework from the outside will make sure that your service is unavailable under greetings processor. It will do the DNS resolvement for you. So then greeting processor will always point to the correct one that you specify in the environment. 
This will have greeting processor resources. Greetings later on and it will be used to access the greetings, to access that and actually to post new greetings here. And what we do, um, we create a new greeting by posting a JSON to our service, to our new second service. So we use something that is available in Java E7 today, it's called JSONP. To create a JSONP object, we add a name to our JSON object. This is no. This is now our JSON request, and we send the request by the target um, request with a media type JSON, and that will be posted to this target, and then read into a new response. JSON object and this is the response and from the response we will get a JSON back and it will contain the greeting now the full greeting we provided a name over JSON and we get a greeting back so we ask for a greeting and of course always do readable code so here we say create request JSON right send request and extract greeting so this is more readable any questions so now this in the first application will use the second application to communicate via HTTP via JSON to access our new greeting now this is done now we want to have a second application, our greeting processor. And we will open this via IntelliJ as well. Greeting processor. And this is the same story as before. Also a POM file for Java E7. And we will make the greetings accessible in a greeting resource available on the path greetings and here we can post new greetings and get a JSON back, right? Create greeting from a JSON object and then we can return a greeting that comes from a greeting processor right so here we will ask the JSON object give us the name that was just provided by the first application get string name and from that name output a greeting calculate greeting from the name right And this will now output the greeting here. This will calculate it for us. And then we'll return a new JSON object with the greeting. And here, of course, we will calculate greeting and once in a while because we need that later and I will show you something later we um, have a very difficult calculation for Duke so if the name is Duke and this takes a long time so we wait for two seconds so sometimes it's very slow and now we simulate this Log support park nanos is something like thread sleep without the exception. So we wait for um, 3 billion 
uh, nanoseconds and not always but only on random new random next boolean so sometimes we have to wait for two seconds if the name is Duke to simulate something I will show you later and basically this second application now calculates everything for us so now we can package this into a WAR file the same way as before and we can now of course run it in a docker container as well to do so we need a docker file right any questions in the same way as before we specify processor we specify a WAR file to the deployment directory wildfly standalone deployments and this will build our docker container for our second application the same way as before we can do this by docker build greeting processor tag one and in the same way it will build this very fast and because of the slow network it won't be that fast to push it but it's again just a couple of kilobyte right so it will push this now into our registry and in the same way we will then have to push the first application again because we changed it but let me show you this first so we could take this docker container and run it as before but of course we want to run it in Kubernetes right so in the same way as before I will use a Kubernetes configuration for the greeting processor of course again using this YAML approach so now what you saw here is that this uses the service right the logical name greeting processor and this is now what we specify in the Kubernetes configuration sorry via specifying the greeting processor service name here using port 8080 and this is exactly what is accessed from the first application and that is the reason why this is now very simple to configure even over several environments because the service name is always the same in the same environment you can isolate several environments using namespaces and all kind of fancy stuff but the idea is that you access logical service names and these don't change no matter where you are and that makes configuration very simple because the orchestration framework now builds the correct containers together greeting processor for the deployment this will now deploy our second application by specifying the image um, greeting processor tag one and it will always pull a new image and now we can run this in Kubernetes as well right we pushed it to our registry Kubernetes will actually go to a registry and pull it so now it can deploy this as well oh I forgot something very good forgot the liveness probe I don't want this right now I can actually delete it it's a good way to have something uh, but not right now it will create a deployment and a service for you and if we look at this it now created the container it says container creating this is because the network is slow now it's pulling the uh, um, image but again like in pushing if the base image is already there then it only pulls the latest for kilobyte so not much it only push, uh, pulls the whole thing once and then it adds up new layers or it changes layers but the layers are very small and in the same way we can see the services here and we now have a new service for the greeting processor that we can access in the same way as before so we can now access our application with that port from the outside as well greeting processor resources greetings and this will now 
Oh, actually, it it's still it's um, it's still pulling the um, the container, which you can see. It's ah no, it's just running. Now you see it. You got a response. Of course, method not allowed because you only can create something via post. So we will post the JSON to our processor just to test it. Content type application JSON. I'm using curl here. You could uh, use any REST client of your choice. It actually doesn't matter. Um, we will post a greeting with a name, Hiroshima. And this will output hello Hiroshima for us. And to showcase a slow network, if we post hello Duke, then once in a while it will be slower. Hello Duke, and sometimes we have to wait for two seconds. Now, if we want um, to in include our changes, I coded the changes in the first application. Now I have to rebuild it, if it of course, right? So I rebuilt a new WAR file. And now I also have to rebuild a new Docker container, right? Hello Cloud. And this here is the sorry. This here is the version, the tag, colon two, because now it's a new version. Normally your continuous integration server will do this for you, right? The Jenkins builds the WAR file, and if you're using Docker containers, then your CI server also builds the container image. And if you build this, it's again really fast because it just changed the latest four kilobyte to other five kilobytes maybe. I can now show in a second how big it actually is, but it's it's not huge. So this is the reason why it builds very fast and also you see oh it's nine kilobyte. It pushes really fast even over the slow network. And it will push that into the Docker registry. And then, of course, what we have to specify, we have to change the image in Kubernetes. So this normally also would be done by the CI server. Now we will do this ourselves by going to the um, YAML configuration file and specifying now we want to have the new image 2. Hello Cloud image 2, then 1. Now it's pushed. And what we can do, we can say, just apply the new configuration. And the nice story is Kubernetes Cube Control Apply will see what actually changed and just apply the latest changes in my configuration file. And then what you can see, that it now creates a second container for Hello Cloud. This, just as before, will pull the new image, but it still runs the only uh, the old one and this is why you can still access the old service greeting processor hello cloud it's still there even though it's currently being redeployed and that is the blue green deployment approach that kubernetes applies out of the box and this is the nice story of being production ready so out of the box the service says i um, all of the time want to have at least one running container one running pod that I can route my traffic to. So all of the time you will have an accessible application, which is good. So if something here fails with the new one, it will keep the old one as um, long as you don't have a new version there. And yeah, now what you didn't see, the uh, new one got created, it was running, and as soon as the liveness probe, what you see, gets some result back and it says, hey, I'm alive, the new one, it will kill the old one and it will reroute the traffic like in a blue-green deployment approach. And this is done out of the box and which is really nice because now it's still working. What you can see now, it's the new version of Hello Hiroshima and this will now access our new application. So now the new version contains our new API with the second approach, Hello World, and this will actually go to the second application and ask for Hello World. And the last thing I want to show you, if you ask for Duke, 
this is why the reason why I included the simulation latency N now once in a while it will take two seconds which is bad because the latency of application 2 now affected application 1 because it loads it in a synchronous way and what we want to have in a cloud native approach and this is also one of the um, things here you want to have um, where is it? Um, concurrency disposability maximize robustness and you want to be um, resilient against these changes so this is um, this is called a circuit breaker approach if one application is slow or fails it should not pull down all the others so what we do in order to be more resilient on our client side on our application one side we include timeouts this is not um, done per default so if it takes two seconds it will wait two seconds if it takes longer it will even wait much longer which is bad for example if you want to specify wait only 200 milliseconds and not longer and then afterwards it's better to provide nothing rather than to let the client the user wait because waiting for the user is bad users are impatient we want to include a timeout here and in Java E7 this is unfortunately not there yet but what we have to do is specify our REST easy client this is the implementation of JAXRS on the client side that we use in Wildfly but the good story is it can be provided so it won't make our WAR file bigger this is just another dependency that we have to specify and now instead of the client builder we will use a REST easy client builder that will have all these timeouts for us so for example we take a second timeout from 200 milliseconds and the establish connection timeout from let's say one second this would uh, you would specify this of course depending on your environment so if you're in the same network then sometimes 200 milliseconds is even too long sometimes it's too short you have to specify some value based on your service level agreement on your SLA what you want to to be able to serve for right but here we say we don't want to wait any longer than 200 milliseconds and then it will throw an exception and of course throwing exceptions now is bad we could catch them later but what we could also do we could include another functionality from Java EE to say in this example if nothing um, is available because of some error we just want to output a default or maybe null or whatever you want to specify and we can do so by using so-called interceptors of course we could say try catch here and if exception then something else but we could also apply them in a more loosely coupled way interceptors in uh, this uh, define an interceptor here that I just called guard which is an interceptor and the interceptor will have uh, a round invoke, invoke method object around invoke Th that will be uh, invoked well around the actual method it will have an invocation context and it basically says return context proceed so this will call our method and if we now want to for example catch some exception try this and if you fail with any exception then you would include some fancy handling log logic here you could add some metrics you could post an inter in, in uh, sorry incident somewhere or you could say this is a bad example but for now it's sufficient return just null and this will in a loosely coupled way add this concern to our method and then if you have any error on the client side it will just return nothing this is better than waiting forever to a method just to be more resilient on the client side and what we do now we rebuild this using maven of course and we rebuild it using docker so fortunately as you can see this is very fast if we would have to rebuild 20 megabyte of um, 
Maven build of Docker build, then this would take a long time. This still takes a couple of seconds because the network is super slow. But in the meantime, we can edit our YAML file to include version 3, right? And if our now 10 kilobyte huge application <laughs> is pushed, then we can reapply the Kubernetes configuration. Let's see. At least it's still doable over the network. Otherwise it won't be doable at all. And okay. Apply the new configuration. We see the same story again. Rolling deployments. Now version two is live and it pulls version three. And as soon as this is then created, it will run the second one, the version 3. It will probe the version 3 until it's, it's there. Let's watch this in another way. Let's use the Unix watch. And once this is there, now you see it terminating. It terminates the first one because the second one is there and it's up and running. And now it's gone. Now it only has the new version. And we can now ask for... It's still the same service, same IP. We can ask for Hello World. This works. And we can ask for Hello Duke. And once in a while, it will output nothing. And null, per default via JAXRS, is two or four no content. So it says, OK, either you have the greeting for Duke or a 204 is maybe a bad example. You could say service temporarily not available or some other default error message. But now it's fast. This is one way of making the client side more resilient and a way how to connect enterprise applications in a cloud environment. Do you have any questions? Yes, very good. Um, any wha what Maybe Java? The um, the demonstration of that specific approach or um, of of what? Yeah. I don't. Uh, how they connect to each other. Um, I don't have a picture here right now. So how um, I could show you a picture, first of all, of, of Docker. I saw a picture. Oh, yeah, slow network. Um, there is a nice picture that shows the difference between, do uh, between Docker containers and VMs. Um, basically, this one that is, well, it shows you that a Docker container runs in the Linux kernel and not um, as a hardware abstraction layer. So why is it not opening? Oh. And I think I have to click just once. Yeah. But this is, of course, not big enough. So this is showing you that it's running directly in the Linux kernel. You don't need a hardware abstraction layer. And therefore, you have more performance. Um, Yes, in a Docker container. But, uh, I, I'd like to know your demonstration. Yes, and in my demonstration, for my demonstration, I don't have um, any diagram. What it basically is, I have two applications running, the um, Hello Cloud and the greasing processor, and they run as a service. So from the outside in Kubernetes, what you saw, I access something with curl, and this is now the Hello Cloud service, and before that, you saw the Hello Greeting service. So it is a service that is available here using this IP. Externally, you would do a DNS name. So you have like two different web services, two different websites, if you want. Internally, what they do, they can res uh, resolve each other via the logical name. And that is the access. So application one can, can access application two 
like you could do using an IP address, but the logical name is much better because it doesn't change. And if you are in this environment or if you are somewhere else, then the logical name internally is always the same. So they can always um, refer to greeting processor. And from the outside, what you do, you only access w application one. They, the two of them um, communicate via HTTP and using that JSON object, I said. So the first one sends hello and in a J um, sorry name in a JSON object and the second application responds with greeting equals something with the calculated greeting. This is the um, communication between each other. They both run as Kubernetes services that are... Sorry? At Kubernetes services. This is what you saw here. I have one service for the Hello Cloud. This is accessed from the outside. And this one internally accesses the second one, the greeting processor. These two services are both backed by so-called pods or deployments. There is only, I could specify a lot of them if I want. And they are routed from the service. So I could load balance to five Hello Clouds if I want to. But I only need one. And this is the running container. So there is one container in the Hello Cloud and one container for the greeting processor. These containers, both of them contain the specific applications. Both of them contain a Java E7 application server, Java plus the operating system. This is then run. And they communicate via this logical service name that then routes to the specific container. And this is how that is done. The resolvement of the logical name is done via Kubernetes, via the ser service to deployment routing. And that's it. Yeah, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a um, picture for you prepared. So what I could do, I could uh, draw a short, well, we don't have a board, but it's basically two dots that are the services with two other dots that are the instances, and the service can access each other, or basically the instance can access over the service the other instance. And this is how the connection is done. Okay. Substituted, yeah. It isn't. That is, the, uh, that is the nature of Docker containers. These are one-shot objects. You run a Docker container, you do some calculation, you, you store something in the file system. Once you stop it, it's gone. This is a feature. Because you don't want any um, temporary files or something. If you want to have something persistent state, then you include a database, and then you can mount something like a volume, like a network storage example. You say, I want this database to be persistent, and then you explicitly specify it. You can do this in Kubernetes. This is a more sophisticated approach. You can um, add something like a persistent volume, and then you point your database files to that. Everything else is gone, but per default, everything is gone afterwards. Um, it's basically a different service that can be run in a different container but you connect to the database and your application server doesn't store any pr any persistent files yeah yeah thanks for the question any other questions yeah yes right it's not uh, resolvable from the outside. If you want to have a logical name or something like a DNS name from the outside, you would have to spec uh, specify it um, uh, extra. 
via so-called ingresses. So I ac here accessed my IP with the service port and basically what you, say, uh, what you then can specify from the outside is a DNS name, like, um, like a canonical um, name with, for example, hellocloud.myenvironment.com something if you want but this is then you're totally free to specify this this is an extra uh, effort to do but the logical service names are um, just uh, resolved internally so if you want to specify instead of the P IP the logical name what I did internally in the application this is only done if you already run inside um, Kubernetes in the container yeah, very good question anything else Yes. Uh, which part? Yeah. Yes. Um, Kubernetes here is running on um, a local Kubernetes cluster uh, using Minikube that runs in a virtual machine. But this is just to showcase something locally. What you would do in a production environment that you have several machines and that you have a real cluster, not just one machine, but a lot of them. And one big feature of Kubernetes is that it actually distributes your load. So what you could do, I only have one instance running of my service, but I can say I want my service and I want three instances. And then it would distribute the instances over your actual Kubernetes nodes. If you say you have several servers that together form a Kubernetes cluster, then you would distribute it, for example. And this is all done via Kubernetes. So they do the distribution for you, they tell which one are, um, are redeployed, and so on and so forth. So, for, But for the demonstration, it just runs here at basically one node. But it's the same story, so it doesn't change anything for the configuration. It would just later on then outscale, if you like. Yes. 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 The registry. Yes. Right. So uh, Kubernetes needs to pull it somewhere. And as Kubernetes would normally run in production, it can't access your local machine, of course. So you would have to push the Docker image somewhere first. Either you take the public Docker hub um, that is available for everybody, but what is normally used for an enterprise company is, of course, a private and own registry. This is something like Nexus. Nexus for WAR files or JAR files is like what a Docker registry is for Docker images. So you can push it there and then you can pull it later on using some image label. Yeah, very good question. Well then, thank you very much, Ricardo Zaymas, for your attention.